Okay, continuing here in chapter 8 of How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, uh, talking about parables, we're on slide number 15, okay? So uh, we're talking about here understanding the parables, and one of the things we need to do is try to find the points of reference. Again, these are like, you know, ledges, if you will, if you're climbing, right? And, and, and as these parables were deliver, delivered orally, okay, not in written form originally, these are significant, okay? So, so they give the example of the Good Samaritan, um, and, and of course, the, the great question in that parable is, and who is my neighbor, right? The, uh, the religious leader is trying to justify himself um, before Jesus. And so there's uh, two major points of reference in this story. That's the man in the ditch, right? And then the Samaritan. Um, and so, so these are important, uh, again, to, to see that. And I don't want to belabor these points. A lot of this is fairly self-evident, but, but that's what you need to be looking for in the parables to understand them. If you go to slide number 16, you know, they talk about how, you know, the, the teacher of the law gets caught in, in the parable. The teacher of the law that says, well, who, who, you know, who is my neighbor trying to press that on Jesus? And of course, as Jesus shares the story, um, you know, you know, as the story goes on, you're thinking, well, the priest is going to help this guy uh, or, or the, the scribe's going to help this guy. And of course, you've got the Samaritan um, and, and Samaritans were, were despised. Uh, there was great prejudice amongst the Jews against Samaritans because they were looked at as kind of mongrel, half-breed uh, Jews that intermarried with pagans. And so their, 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 their bloodlines got messed up. Uh, they got disconnected from the Jewish tribal system and their religious system got messed up and their families got, got messed up. So, you know, if you think prejudice in 21st century terms and, you know, there's prejudice in America, there's prejudice all throughout the world um, because it's a sin thing. It's not a skin thing. It, it's, it's indicative of the fall of man. Um, and of course, in, in Jesus's time, it was no different. And, um, but, but, but the, the, um, the low view of Samaritans that the Jews had and the discrimination uh, that they had against them was probably far worse than even what we have uh, in, in America in the 21st century. And so that's why, you know, Jesus making the Samaritan the good Samaritan that we think of today. Well, back then he was the bad Samaritan. He was the rotten Samaritan. He was the terrible Samaritan. He was the, he was the guy. He was the bad guy. And, and, and again, the, the power of this particular parable is that Jesus makes the bad guy the good guy. And that's what shocks this, this religious teacher because he's thinking, man, the, the priests are going to pull off the, the good deed or, or the scribes are going to pull off the good deed. And instead, it's, it's, it's the despised one that is, is the hero, okay, is, is when, when the second commandment talks about, or the great commandment, rather, talks about you shall love the Lord, that, uh, that God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus could have said that in response to the request, well, who's my neighbor? But obviously it was far better for him to use the story of, of the Good Samaritan because that pretty much just nailed the, just this religious leader and, and it revealed to him uh, that, that his supposed piety, his supposed religious strength, his supposed spiritual life wasn't as great as he thought um, because of, of the Samaritan being the good guy, okay? Okay. Um, so, um, so anyway, there, there's, there's that. Again, I'm going to skip over to um, slide number um, 18, talking about the prodigal son. Again, another pretty familiar uh, parable, okay? The context is the Pharisees murmuring over Jesus' acceptance of eating with the wrong kinds of people, right? Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners at the bars or something comparable to that, which was, you know controversial at the time. And so, um, you know, he's trying, Jesus through the story of the prodigal son is trying to share that, that God freely forgives, freely loves the lost and accepts them with, with great joy. Um, and those who consider themselves righteous reveal themselves as unrighteous if they don't share the father's and the lost son's joy. In other words, one of the marks that, that, uh, uh, 
the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus, and the character of Jesus is being worked out in our life is if we rejoice to see lost people coming to know the Lord. You know, if we're kind of, you know, indifferent towards it or whatever, well then, hey, man, the heart check time, uh, check your spiritual pulse, okay? Something's going on in your life. And then, of course, with the religious leaders of Jesus' day, it was far worse because they considered themselves self-righteous. They didn't need a savior. They were fine. You know, all these, um, you know, all these social vermin, right? The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, things like that. You know, the, the fact that God was accepting them, that, you know, that Jesus in, in eating with them and, and reaching out to them, that was scandalous to the pious Jewish mind, okay? Um, and so, so they talk about, if you go down to slide number 19, you know, obviously the prodigal is, is you know, we're pretty familiar with that. But then he addresses, you know, the other individual in the store. We're talking about points of reference here, right? You've got the father, you've got the prodigal, and then you've got the son that stayed home, right? The, the righteous dude. And, and of course, you know, that, that is where this, pro, this uh, parable, you know, uh, exposes hearts too because the individual that never walked away from God, the individual that, that was faithful in church, the individual that never, ever sinned, that never, ever, you know, strayed. And so, you know, suddenly, you know, he was somebody that, that you know, is exposed as somebody that, um, you know, needed a revelation of God's grace, needed a revelation of, of God's love, right? And in fact, they, they make the statement in the book, can you imagine anything worse than coming home and falling into the hands of the older brother, right? Um, is, is that, you know, again, these parables, they're trying to shock you. They're trying to knock you off dead center and expose your heart. And, and, and looking at some of these frames of references uh, can be very, very helpful, okay? So that's the easy part, okay? The difficult part, if you go to slide number 20, is when you have what they call contextless parables, right? You don't know the audience. You don't know who he's talking to. Is he talking to a relig religious leader? No, is he talking to, to a sinner? No, we, we don't know, okay? Um, so uh, what you wanna do is, is look at these and repeat them enough to where some points of reference do start to emerge, okay? They give examples of the workers of the vineyard. There's only three points of reference, the landowner, the full day workers, and the one hour workers, okay? Who would have been caught in a story like this? Obviously the hearers, identify with the full day laborers. In other words, that this story appears unjust and uh, the treatment of the owner uh, to the laborers appears unjust is because you're reading it through the context of what about these guys that have worked all day? That's not fair to them, right? In other words, the idea is not fairness. The issue is God is gracious, is that, is that God will save somebody early in their life and at the end of their life, right, is that salvation is for everyone. And, and, and even if you serve God all of your life and have been faithful and led thousands or tens of thousands of people to the Lord and, and have had a great ministry, well, God's going to lavish grace on you, and he has. But also that same grace is going to be lavished on, you know, the death row inmate who, you know, lived a life of, 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 of great sin who repents on his deathbed. Right? Trying to show that you know, the graciousness and the love of God is far beyond our human ability to understand it. That's why that parable shocks us. Okay, um, So um, moving on to, uh, to slide number 21. Um, again, uh, talking about uh, the kingdoms that deal, or I'm sorry, the parables that deal with the kingdom of God. Okay, um, So number one, the introduction, the kingdom of God is like is not to be taken with the first element mentioned in the parable. That is, the kingdom of God is not like a mustard seed or a treasure in a field or a merchant. It, it literally means it's like this in the kingdom of God, okay? So in other words, when you see the kingdom of God referencing these parables, it's trying to tell you something about the nature of the kingdom, okay? Not just one of the points of reference. In other words, the kingdom is, is it, it's like this in the kingdom. It's not specifically like it, but it is generally like this. Jesus, again, a big part of, of Jesus' ministry was establishing the kingdom of God. And these parables give us hints 
clues, glimpses as to what kingdom life is like. And of course, for all of us as Christians, we're praying that our lives, our hearts, our character, our words, our actions exemplify this, okay? If you go to slide number 22, um, no, point number two, they, they note here, it's tempting to treat these parables differently from those we have just looked at as though they are actually teaching vehicles rather than stories calling for responses, but that would be to abuse them. In other words, sometimes they do call for responses. While the divinely inspired collections in Mark 4 and Matthew 13 are intended to teach us, to teach us about the kingdom, these parables were a part of Jesus's actual proclamation of the kingdom as dawning with his own coming. They are vehicle, vehicles of a message calling for response in his invitation and call for discipleship. In other words, as he's trying to show you, you know, these parables of the kingdom, it's supposed to give you kind of vision, like, oh my gosh, I want that. I, I want a life like that. My life's not like that, right? Life in this first century Greco-Roman world where, where, where life is cheap and morals are degenerate and we're under the oppression of the Romans. And in other words, you suddenly catch this glimpse of the kingdom, almost like, you know, an angelic choir behind you going, oh, right? It, it, it causes you to, to desire after it, right? That, that's what Jesus is trying to do. Remember, Jesus is the master storyteller, right, uh, bar none. And, and, and he did a phenomenal job of causing people to enter into the stories he was, he was telling there, okay? Um, so, so, so that's what he's trying to do. So I'm gonna stop there and we'll resume with slide number 23.